Okay, welcome back everybody to our second panel. I always feel like someone is listening to me. Voice assistance, the Internet of Things, and privacy. And I thought uh, before, I go, before I introduce our amazing speakers, um, we could play a little game. Um, so if you could just raise your hand if the following questions apply to you. Who here has a smart speaker at home? Okay, couple, good. Um, who here has a smartphone? That's everybody, okay. Um, and who of you uses Siri or Google Assistant on your smartphone? Fewer people, okay. And who uses Hey Siri or Hey Google? That's, it's, uh, it's good that non, no phone went off. <laughs> <That's wrong. laughs> All right, so, uh, so basically, right, if you, have a, if you either have a smart speaker or you have your phone react to Hey Siri or Hey Google, you're carrying a listening device in your pocket or have one in your house. And um, so we want to unpack this a little bit. This panel is for you, right? Um, we're going to explore what voice assistants, smart speakers, and other smart devices can do um, for us, uh, how that might affect your privacy, but also your children's privacy and potentially their development. Um, and we'll also look at how attackers could use some of the smart technology against you. And um, without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. Over there, we got uh, David Jurgens. Uh, David is assistant professor in the University of Michigan School of Information, and uh, he also holds an appointment in computer science and engineering. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, and he was a postdoc um, in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford Uni University, and before that at McGill University. And his research combines natural language processing, network science, and data science to discover, explain, and predict human behavior in large social systems. Among many accolades, uh, his work has won the Cosarelli Prize from the National Academy of Science and the Cialdini Prize from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. And um, he co-advises the University of Michigan student team competing in the Alexa Prize Grand Challenge. Um, to the left of David, we got Sarah Rampazzi. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, yes, great. Um, she's a research investigator and intermittent lecturer in, um, oops, pressing buttons here while talking, in computer science and engineering in the College of Engineering, and she holds a PhD from the University of Pavia in Italy. And her research focuses on hardware security, in particular um, on defending cyber physical systems and their sensors against hardware-based vulnerabilities. And her research has been covered by CNN, The New York Times, Ars Technica, Wired, ABC, NBC, NBC News, and many other outlets. And then uh, closest to me, we got Jenny Radeski. And uh, Jenny is a developmental behavioral pediatrician and assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Michigan Medical School. And she re received her MD from the Harvard Medical School, trained in pediatrics at uh, Seattle Children's Hospital, and completed subspecialty training in developmental behavioral pediatrics at Boston Medical Center. Her NIH-funded research focuses on the use of mobile interactive technology by parents and young children, and how this relates to ch child self-regulation and parent-child interaction. Uh, clinically, her work focuses on developmental and behavioral conditions in low-income and underserved populations. Um, among the many notable things about Jenny, she was the lead author of the American Academy of Pediatrics Guidelines about Media Use by Young Children in 2016. And she works to translate digital media research for families through her collaborations with the AAP and Melissa and Doug Toys. Uh, so I'm very excited about this panel. And um, our first speaker is going to be David Jurgens. And David, you're up. Great, well, I'm happy to talk to you today. Uh, so specifically, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about social chatbots. Uh, in particular, one that I'm very fond of, uh, which is, we're gonna call Audrey. And this is uh, the Michigan's en uh, entry into the Amazon Alexa Prize Grand Challenge that I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, so, so typically when you think about these voice assistants, there's kind of two things that we, we, we normally think about, like the, the, the kinds of things that they, they do for us. So they're goal oriented. We ask Siri like, hey, when does this restaurant close? Or uh, like, hey, like, so, like, how do I get to some place? And they'll give us directions. Um, but there's another thing that we could actually do with chatbots, which, oh, apparently did not show up, so I don't know how these animations are gonna work. But we can be ch social with them. So we not only have task-oriented dialogues, or task-oriented uh, dialogues, but we also have open-ended dialogues. So you might say, hey, Siri, uh, how's your day going? And if it's, you know, the uh, programmers have felt kind of cutesy, they might say, like, I'm doing pretty well. Like, how about you? 
But then you might have to do another conversation, like keep that conversation going, and then it gets really bad very quickly. And so what the uh, work is I'm working on with this team is trying to build that ladder kind. So we're not focused on a particular task. Uh, we're focused more on open to dialogue, where maybe the task is bringing you joy or being a good conversation partner, which is way harder in practice. So if you think about how we uh, build these systems, uh, oh boy, I think all of my animations have disappeared. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, all the dialogue systems, uh, are, there's many kinds of, of things that we might want to do for a task-oriented system. And so we often have these large databases on the back end. So all the reviews that you've entered into Yelp, these end up like in the back end maybe uh, for Siri, or things like Amazon has its product database uh, tied into Alexa. Um, but doing this for an open-ended system is actually much harder. And in the diagram below that you can't see, uh, there's often a lot of social information that we're missing in sort of any sort of structured form. Like, how do you be a good conversation partner? There's no sort of open-ended dialogue or open-ended database that will tell you how to do that. So if you think about the kinds of problems we might be solving, uh, things like I have a question or I need to get this done, these don't really work in the context. Uh, these, well, I don't know whose slides these are, but. Uh, in terms of the Amazon Alexa prize, there's lots of these kinds of, uh, just to give a quick summary, so we are one of 370 teams that were uh, entered into here. And there's a lot of benefits to being in this challenge because we actually get deployed on Amazon devices. So if you say to your Alexa Echo, uh, you might say, hey, let Alexa, let's chat. You'll actually get to, to talk to one of these teams and be prepared to be underwhelmed, but uh, we will actually chat back with you. Um, you know, and we get you know, thousands of dialogues a day, so it's really excited. But the big challenge is, who, who actually wants to talk to a chatbot for 20 minutes? The goal is 20 minutes and to get a, like a four out of five star rating. Um, what do you talk about for 20 minutes? If you think about the last conversation you had with a colleague, maybe it was a minute, two minutes, you talk to your, your significant other, you talk to your kids, 20 minutes is a long time. So thinking about having an engaging conversation really focuses what do these chatbots could do socially? Uh, and people will talk about anything. So what does Audrey's architecture look like? There's a lot of stuff uh, that was going to be animated, but it's not, so I will show you some speech levels instead. Kind of the big things about what has to go into building a chatbot. I want to give you at least a sense of what happens in the back end. One part is thinking about what is the user talking about? Are they asking a question? Are they making a statement? What kinds of things are they talking about? Are they making a reference to something that happened way earlier in the conversation that we should know about? If someone says like, oh yeah, yesterday that thing went pretty good, what is that thing even referring to? So of course we have to keep track in the upper right as to what, like, what do we know about them based on what they've said before. So if we can keep track of like, the dialogue they go over time. So for example, Siri does, tries to do some of this. So if you say, hey Siri, uh, you know, is, when is that restaurant open? And it may give you some time, it's like, oh, do they have vegetarian? You have to understand that that's refer referring to the, re the, the restaurant you just asked about. So then of course we have to figure out how to respond to them. Um, so we have to think about things we could say and then, of course, here's the, here's the open-ended chatbot task of how do we make sure that whatever we say keeps the conversation going? So in improv, there's always the yes and to sort of keep that improv going. How do we do that in a, in a structured way? And then how do we even say it? Do we say it very excitedly with lots of emotion or do we say it very neutrally with an even tone? And sometimes those are funny, but not always. So uh, I will say that I'll show you some real, uh, some, I'll show you some real interactions, which are apparently very small here now. Uh, these are not actually real things. These are paraphrased to preserve all privacy because it is privacy day after all. Um, but here's a, here's a good example of why this is hard. Where the user has says, we start out saying like, I'm feeling festive. What's the best New Year's resolution you've ever made? Trying to get the ball rolling, kind of a good conversation starter. And the user says, don't. And then so we're like, okay, yeah, let's, uh, you know, the bot's like, oh, well, why not? And the user says, echo. And so again, well, maybe we could try one together. You can see that this conversation has clearly gone off the rails very quickly, but this is the kind of thing that you have to be robust to. But sometimes it works okay. Uh, so here someone says, hi, I'm an Alexa Prize, welcome back. So we have recognized that the user has talked to us before. And we say, uh, what is cut off here, it says like, uh, how much time do you usually spend like, on the internet? And the person says two and a half hours. We kind of botch it and we say like, wow, it hours? <laughs> what do you do on the computer? And the user, uh, response. We say, oh, let's, I also like to do it, or I like to it. We've also, again, screwed up here. But you can get the sense that they're actually like, we're trying to make jokes and we try to keep the conversation going. So this is a really hard domain to think about what's the possibility of chatbots. They work really well in certain circumstances, but not really in these kind of open-ended things, which requires a lot of technology. 
Uh, and that's a, it really takes to a team, a whole team to build this bot. So in the upper right, uh, to be animated, we have uh, our, our star uh, lead who has organized most of this, uh, Chung Hoon, and then there's a, another 11 students who are working on this with four other un university undergrad research, uh, freshmen and transfer students who are getting into research. Uh, and then me and Nikola Banovich, uh, who's a professor over in CSC, who are the least important, but serve as an advisory role as we can, uh, helping build this thing. So I'm happy to talk about this in the future as well. Uh, but um, if you have a chance, you know, try to chat with Alexa. Maybe you'll get a chance to talk with Audrey under the hood without realizing it. So thank you. All right, thank you, David. And uh, similar to Christian, I'm also gonna play the role of a panelist in addition to being a moderator. We're all like, like uh, ambidextrous here. Um, so I wanna talk with you a little bit about smart speakers and, and privacy. So um, there are lots of interesting convenience functions when it comes to smart speakers, right? You can control your music, you can connect them to your smart homes, uh, uh, you can have prolonged conversations with them and make New Year's resolutions. Um, all things that are possible. Um, we conducted research to better understand how people, um, how privacy factors, you can't hear? No? Okay. Uh, be closer to the mic. Let's see if we can make that happen. Yes, okay, this works better, I think. Um, yeah, so we conducted a research study to better understand how privacy factors into the decision to actually adopt a smart speaker and bring one into your home. And um, we, for this, we um, interviewed um, non-users of smart speakers and then also conducted interviews and a diary study with users of smart speakers. And for the non-users we found that the privacy concerns is actually one of the main reasons why, why people do not buy smart speakers. And this is auto advancing, which is not great. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna race through it then. Um, uh, and the other one is perceived lack of utility. They could, just can't imagine how um, these smart speakers would be useful to them. For users, um, the dominant factor for buying a smart speaker is that they see convenience in it, They're, or they um, really want to be early adopters and um, like that identity. But uh, what, what didn't come up at all is concerns about privacy. Until we, we probed deeper, and then um, we actually got a lot of explanations why they're not as worried about privacy. So some people just had misconceptions about uh, what data is actually being collected, how feasible it is for data to be stored, um, or to, for it to be accessed. Um, and there's lots of trust in the companies, but also in the social system uh, that exists around them, that the companies will, will look out for them, and that, um, that the, um, uh, the government will look out for them, and you know, they're not gonna do anything bad with your data. But there's also a lot of resignation. So even the people who were using these devices regularly, there were quite a few who um, said, well, I have to accept this um, invasion, uh, potential invasions in my privacy, because I want to use the smart speaker, and there's really no other way for me of um, using these devices. So just because they use them doesn't mean they're necessarily happy with all the data being collected. Um, and then in, in further work, what we found is that um, the privacy controls that are built into these smart speakers are actually not meeting people's needs very well. Um, for one, privacy controls are being misunderstood, right? So these devices have, uh, at the very top, a mute button you can press, but most people actually thought it would just mute the speaker, basically turn off the sound, and didn't even think it was a function to mute the microphone. Um, and so no, no one used it really. Right. Um, we also see that it uh, requires a modality change. So um, what that means is usually you interact with speech with a smart speaker, but if you want to mute the device, you have to walk to it and press the button. Right, so it creates an additional barrier because you need to shift out of one interaction modality to a different one you typically don't use with the device. And um, th then what we also found is that some of these privacy controls are actually being used to invade people's privacy. So um, for these smart speakers, you can review previous commands you've given to the smart speaker and um, people would use that to see what their house sitter has been up to while they were gone or what the babysitter was doing or their house guests. Um, right, so, um, it's not, not necessarily, like it's a tool that's, or these, these um, review tools are meant as, a pri as privacy controls, but they're not really necessarily used that way and also have unintended consequences. And one of the things we've been recommending as part of our research is that there really needs to be better ways of um, control privacy for these devices through the same interaction modality that you're using for interaction. So if it's a voice-based device, then there should also be voice controls um, and ways to have actually conversations about privacy with the smart speaker. 
And then last year we actually saw uh, Amazon started to introduce some of these voice commands. So now you can um, tell your Alexa, delete everything I said today, uh, or delete what I just said. Um, but these are not the default settings. If you want to actually use this functionality, you have to go somewhere deep in the Alexa settings and activate that feature to make it work. Right? So what we're looking at in our research is, um, well, are there maybe other ways how we can better integrate privacy controls into interactions? And one pro project we've been working on is looking at the use of interpersonal communication cues. So typically when we talk to someone, we, we look at that person and we look the person in the eyes, right? Can we use this to detect when a person is looking at that device and only in those uh, moments turn on um, the, the microphone to look for commands? Or um, when we want to um, ex tell each other something that is maybe secret and not meant for others in the room, we tend to whisper, right? Um, and uh, so we, we built a prototype where if you speak quietly, it um, actually doesn't reach the threshold to activate the speech recognition in the device. And only if you speak louder, hey Alexa, then it actually activates the speaker. And these are kind of ways how we can build privacy into how you're already interacting with the device instead of turning it into something that is an additional effort where you have to go into settings and um, to control your privacy. So in, in closing, um, maybe the important takeaways here is that just because people and consumers are using technologies does not mean that they're actually comfortable with the data collection practices or the data sharing practices that come with these devices. Right? It's just they don't have any other choice. Uh, Isa Nakamura talked about the, on, on the earlier panel about the importance of being able to say no. And um, that's something we're, we're trying to work and make possible. And then there needs to, um, with, uh, when we build technology, we really need to go out there and understand users' privacy needs. Um, and you can't solve that by sitting in an office in Silicon Valley. You actually have to go and talk to users and see how they're interacting with the technology. Um, and uh, finally, there are ways of integrating privacy into the user experience in ways that doesn't mean just because I want more privacy, um, my life needs to become more complicated and uh, the way I interact with technology becomes more complicated. Um, and what we're doing in my group is to um, try to advance uh, the, the best practices here and the design best practices. All right, thank you. And next up is Sarah. Good afternoon, you can hear me? <laughs> okay, I'm too short. <laughs> okay, I'm Sarah Rampazzi, I'm a research investigator and I work uh, in the College of Engineering in Outdoor Security. So, oh. here we go, okay. We are submerged in a world of uh, IoT devices and we use them every moment during our daily life. And these devices perceive the world around them through sensors. For example, sensors measure the temperature in your house inside your smart thermostat. Or a sensor can sense if you are getting too close to another car when you are parking. Sensors capture lights and sound on your phone when you are creating an Instagram video, for example. And sensor in uh, your voice assistant capture your comments to turn off the lights when you're going to bed, for example. We are so getting used to these devices that we just assume we know everything about them. And this happens especially with the sensors. We always think that sensor has some sort of digital substitute of our senses. Um, image sensor capture light as our eyes, for example or a pressure sensor can mimic our touch, and the microphone can capture sound as our ears. But sensors are electronic components that can react and be affected by physical phenomenon that we don't know nothing about. In my research, I study how a sensor using connected devices can perceive more than what uh, they're supposed to and we expect to do. And I investigate which are the security and privacy implications of this new feature in our everyday life uh, and uh, how the system changed his behavior from that. So in my last research called Like Commands, for example, my colleague and I discovered how microphone can be affected by light and perceive light as it was sound. 
is something surprising, or maybe I cannot hear light. And uh, if I probably do, probably I will go to the hospital and say, something is wrong with me. But sensor does that. So I study how an adversary can exploit this capability to compromise smart speakers such as Google Home or Amazon Alexa and even Siri. I was able to send an audible invisible commands to this device using a laser that we use for presentation for more than 100 meters away, like a football field. And I was able to execute this action without uh, the owner consent and even knowledge about that it being attacked. In addition, when we observe IoT system, when one system is connected to another, inevitably this system inherits all the vulnerability of the system that is connected to it. So I was not only able to send this unauthorized command, but I was able to take control over other IoT systems that were connected to this uh, smart speaker. And that's because they were not completely designed to cope with this type of thread. So, for example, I was, oh, I was able to open smart locks. I was able to purchase stuff. I was able to turn off light and even thermostat. And uh, even more scary, I was able to start and lock vehicles to that. So as a scientist and engineer, I investigate this risk and I develop techniques to defend and protect IoT system and sensors against this type of threat. Uh, my ultimate goal uh, is to try to um, understand what kind of standard and policy we can uh, uh, make the people aware and uh, the business, the designer of this system, uh, and uh, help them to build this resilient and robust device against this type of threat. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Jenny Rudesky. Um, thanks for sticking around um, and thanks for inviting me. I know um, it's nice to take part in a privacy conference because I'm often just surrounded by uh, pediatricians and researchers within public health or psychology and um, it's been really nice to delve into the area of privacy a bit and to, um, I'm gonna review a little bit of um, the research that I've been doing on how children use mobile and interactive and smart technologies. Um, I really think it's worth focusing our lens on children um, for a couple minutes for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, kids are considered vulnerable because they really, really depend on the adults and, and their environment to shape their health and well-being. So we think about their food environments, their housing environments, um, their relational environments, but I think a lot about their digital environments because the way we design and shape their digital environments is going to help inform the way they think about digital media, how critically aware they are about digital media and how they use it. Um, I also, as a lead author of the AAP guidelines, know that it's really hard to change each individual parent or child's behavior if we're asking them to be the, the gatekeepers to their children's digital media experiences, but we're not actually changing the digital environment that their children are interacting with. We're just gonna be beating our heads against a wall. And so I've gotten very interested in working more with um, designers uh, and folks who think about um, child-computer interaction. I also think it's easier to get political will around children and their privacy and um, their use of technology. I think that it's easier to define when, when things have gotten creepy or crossed the line when it comes to children and technology. Um, so it's worth thinking about the insights that, that children uh, research on children and tech can give us. Um, children are also really rapid and avid adopters of smart and mobile technologies and it's because we've now given them little video game consoles and entertainment consoles that they can take everywhere and, and this makes parenting easier at times. Um, however, there hasn't been a systematic attention to the design of children's technologies to make sure that they match children's unique needs. In other words, they are adopting an environment that's been designed by adults for adults and that we haven't really, other than things like PBS Kids or Tokoboka that are very child-centered design, on a systems level, we haven't really thought about what children uniquely need. Um, 
And I think when people wring their hands about screen time, I wonder, you know, wait, 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 we just gave this child all these tokens and autoplay and all these other sticky design features that are, that are part of our adult-centered design for monetization and where we don't understand why they can't transition off their tablet. And so I think it's really important to address these design features the same way we address just parenting around technology. So part of my uh, research uh, here at University of Michigan has been funded by NICHD to try to understand what are children actually doing on internet connected technologies like smart devices. Um, I don't use a parent recall of screen time because it's just not as accurate or as, as really relevant of a measure of what children are doing in the modern digital environment. So I, as soon as I got here four years ago, I started talking to folks like Sarita Schonebeck and Mark Newman, and I was like, who has some passive sensing apps that I can use on kids' tablets? And we can really know what they're doing. And so now, four years later, we finally have data. I'm working with a startup out of the Bay Area where we've developed an Android app called Chronicle that we are using on 346 Michigan preschoolers. And we've been tracking their tablets. Um, uh, 220 of these children use iOS devices. I've been begging Apple for access to the Screen Time API, but we've basically just been using screenshots of their battery percentages to see what they're doing. But at least we're getting actual data about what apps they're using. This is just the top 10 for um, Android users and iOS users. We have now collected over six months 3,000 distinct apps that kids have been playing on their tablets. There's such an immense amount of apps on the App Store that kids can really easily download. Um, but you can see, it's mostly YouTube. It's a lot of YouTube kids. It's a lot of browser and Netflix. Kids like taking pictures. Kids like talking to Siri in the quick search text box. So all of that has privacy implications to it. Um, and kids like apps like Children, Doctors, Dentists, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Kids also, we were, we were wondering how much educational um, you know, apps are they playing? They're mostly playing games. They're mostly being games that are general audience games that are kind of you know, fun and exciting and easy to download. Um, so you can see that the yellow line is, is just showing that the highest duration, other than YouTube and YouTube Kids, is apps that are more in the general audience categories, which again has different privacy implications because they may have different data trackers um, or uh, permissions associated with those apps. So we've been trying to really characterize the interfaces that kids are interacting with. So I basically have a bunch of undergrads that download apps in my lab and they play them on iPads and um, Samsung tablets. And so we've been coding what a child would see or interact with when they're playing the sorts of games that they're playing in my R21 study. Um, and so what, we've, what we did uh, first was advertising. So we wanted to see what sort of ads show up when you play children's games. We downloaded the 100 most downloaded apps off of Google Play. We found tons of pop-up and interstitial ads, you know, that sometimes were just gross and gory, like Run Sausage Run. Sometimes they were shooter games. Sometimes they were really just benign little house decorating games. But in each case, it's disruptive to the child's gameplay. The child might be two or three years old and might not even know that this is actually an ad, that it's not just part of the game. There's a tiny little X that shows up in the corner you know, after 20 seconds, but being able to navigate a digital interface like this that just looks to me like a copy and paste job from an adult app to a kid's app just seems like a perfect example of how we've not really been rethinking kids' um, redesign of the, of the apps and games they're playing with. However, it's also a great business idea to have little impulsive fingers clicking on ads that come through in ad networks. So, um, that's also possible. We found a lot of camouflaged ads where there's a sparkling little present or a sparkling snowman or something else that drops out of the sky. And if you have immature attention control because you're a four-year-old, you'll click on that and it was usually an ad or another app to download. So there's, again, these mismatches between what we're offering to kids within apps and you know, what their developmental differences might make them respond to. Um, we saw tons and tons of prompts to purchase tokens or watch ad videos. This was, um, oh, what's her name? Masha and the Bear. She had a lot of apps that we, that had top downloads. Um, but she also had kids collect candy all the time. For everything you did, you got candy. You know, and kids don't even understand currency yet under age five. They certainly don't understand digital currency or what it means or what a 99 cent set, um, in-app purchase um, means. I played this exact app with my son 
as just, you know, because we were sitting around, and he was like, I'm so good at this game, I've watched five ad videos. So the children don't even understand. They were creating new norms about how many, how, like what a game is, and whether what the pay-to-play um, model of their digital play is going to be. Um, and finally, we found familiar trusted characters like Strawberry Shortcake who are encouraging in-app purchases. So for example, here, if you don't make blueberry muffins cake that has the blue dye, which is locked, she acts disappointed. So, the, you know, children do develop trusted relationships with their favorite characters like Rescue Bots or Barbie. And so we've been um, filing federal, well, not us, but, but child advocacy groups filed federal trade commission complaints based on some of these manipulative practices found in, in ads. So that also got me, this study that we did that was published in 2018 got me interested in digital privacy because we noticed as we were downloading a lot of these apps, they asked for permissions. So if you're a three or four year old, you can't read yet. So you don't, I mean, most parents don't even know what these permissions mean. But we, we recorded which permissions were requested by some of these apps, and many of them lo requested location or microphone data, um, which just isn't needed for the functioning of the app. So I've started collaborating with Serge Egelman from UC Berkeley to really look at some of the data transmissions that, have, that are coming from the apps that are being played by the children in the study, um, that 346 preschoolers. We've just been looking at the 124 with Android data, um, and my student Feng Wei Zhao has a um, poster out there that you should look at for our full results. But here's just an, a sample of what we've been seeing. So for example, Children's Doctor Dentist, which is one of the most popular ones, shares advertising ID with five domains. It asks for all these different permissions. It classifies itself as an E for everyone, even though it's called Children's Doctor Dentist. Um, lots of kids like playing Kick the Buddy where you beat up this doll. And um, that showed a lot of data transmissions. One child was playing Granny, which is a jump scare app. It's pretty creepy. So, um, you know, a lot of data transmissions, basically to sum up two thirds of the apps that kids were playing on Android devices were sharing persistent identifiers with third party domains. And this was more common in kids who were from um, families with lower education backgrounds of their parents. So that more evidence of a digital divide between the quality and the data collection from the apps that kids are playing. So if we're gonna think about you know, whether it's ethical to be collecting this sort of data from children's apps, it's important to understand what do children think about internet connected devices? What do they think about smart speakers? The data on this is still, um, there's not a lot of it. Um, I also encourage you to go see Kai Wen Sun's uh, a poster out there as well that, that's looking at some of the preliminary data from our M cubed project with myself and Florian and Susan Gelman because kids think differently. They are more magical. They have more animism and trust in smart speakers. There have been studies with children interacting with robots and they think they sleep and feel and think and that they shouldn't be locked in a closet because there's some you know, kind of animism that they imbue in these technologies. So the same thing goes for how they might interact with a smart speaker. The same thing goes with how they might think about their little buddy sidekick, their, their tablet that comes around with them everywhere. So they may have more trust and not have the same level of skepticism and certainly not the technical knowledge to understand the data collection and profiling practices. Um, I'll wrap up just by saying that the UK is way ahead of us in the US. They've just put out this um, age appropriate design code that really addresses some of the manipulative practices as well as the data minimization standards that should probably be enacted in the US as well. Thank you. All right, thank you um, for these great talks. Um, so most important question first. Do you have a smart speaker in your home? No. Can you say why? <laughs> well, I, I actually don't have any smart devices. I, I don't need them. Actually, yes. For research purposes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have Sonos, because we like having music all around, but my husband had a flip phone until last year, so. <laughs> He, you know, that I think I think he also um, like our judgment is also like, what do we need it for? What's the kind of need? We're not as like excited about new gimmicky stuff. But I also think that um, like the question that was before about you know, do you have to resist getting a smart speaker? I guess it's what's what's the use and what's the instrumental purpose that you're gonna have it for. Same thing with some of these like Nest cams um, that there have been news reports about you know people hacking in and communicating with children and calling them derogatory things like. 
you know, really, really having users have some intentional purpose before they make that sort of a, a purchase. Thanks. And so, controlling smart homes has become a key application um, area for some, for voice assistants in particular, but we're just seeing more and more smart home technology kind of pop up. And could each of you tell me what do you see as challenges, but maybe what's opportunities in this development based on your respective backgrounds? One challenge is more uh, related to security in this case. What kind of data and privacy also? Uh, we expect that this device, the more our developer, uh, the more uh, we were able to uh, make complex action and uh, basically substitute routine works that we don't want to or we're just too lazy to do. Uh, and uh, so we expected that the more complicated uh, things that are able to do, the more security implication and privacy they can done for that. So it's very correlated. I think one of the biggest challenges from a pediatric perspective is helping parents um, build digital literacy so they kind of understand the really complex technical issues around data collection and how data is processed and used to create marketing profiles. And, and I didn't know a lot of this. I mean, talking about interdisciplinarity from the last panel is that it's been such a challenge to me from like a medical mind to, to kind of come into, um, you know, partnering with folks from information science or um, and reading some of the papers or, or um, even just looking at that output from Surge's analysis where I was like, why are there 300 different domains that kids identifiers are going to and I googled every single one and I looked at their web page and I was like wow there's so many people promising marketing behavioral insights with this data and I would have a it's so obscured intentionally um, from consumers that I think that's one of the biggest challenges so um, I'm writing new policy with the American Academy of Pediatrics on digital advertising to children and one of our goals is to try to um, translate and help make it a little bit more understandable to families, all of these technical concepts, and make them feel more self-efficacious in navigating it. Because what I've heard when I've interviewed parents for my studies is they're like, I don't get all this, it's too overwhelming, I'm just the same resignation that, you, that you've that you heard. Do you get a sense that the parents actually know what the kids are doing on their tablets, for example? Um, I, uh, some think they do. And others kind of have given up that same level of resignation. It's harder to monitor what your child's doing on a tablet because it's handheld, it's small. They take it to their bedroom compared to what they're watching on a TV. Um, in the study that I presented there with the 346 preschoolers, parents, only 30% of parents were accurate um, in estimating about how much time their child spends on a tablet in a, on every day. Um, and they're not always, we asked when they shared a, a phone with their child, we asked them to tell us what apps their child used that week. And um, many times they would mention an app that wasn't even in the output, or they would, there'd clearly be some child apps in the output that they hadn't mentioned. And so I, I do think it's really hard to monitor. I think, if I remember your study correctly, one of the findings was also that kids are using it in the middle of the night. Yeah. The tablets. yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't include that slide, but so that um, the Android output is time stamped, and so we were able to see that um, uh, at least a handful of children, when we looked at their hourly averages, were using it af you know after midnight, and kind of you know their hourly averages would like wind down after midnight to about 3 a.m. So we were assuming that many were taking their devices into their bedroom and probably playing YouTube. It was usually YouTube or Netflix that was um, playing into those hours. So they may have been just listening to music or other things like that. We don't know that there was actually a user there with them, but it, um, uh, I think <laughs> one of our other ideas is to track what kids are doing and then show that to parents and um, be able to kind of help really kind of reveal or make more transparent what the um, child's usage is or like, um, was discussed in the last panel, kind of making it a little bit more transparent, like what your digital footprint is, or what you know, what your child, what data has been collected about your child. Like, wouldn't it be awesome if at the end of the day, 
it was like, yeah, you earned two dollars for Facebook today. Thank you. You know, you got these like little messages about all the, you know, what your data was worth and like from all the time you spent clicking on different links. That sort of transparency is like um, really needed to help parents understand the day-to-day -day implications of usage. And then the kids are just happy how much money they made Facebook. Because <laughs> I think it's part of the game. <laughs> um, David, um, what's your take on like smart homes and in terms of being able to understand commands and making sense of the data? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that the smart homes are often these kind of task-oriented systems, and so we may use them for voice, but they, I think we'll probably get pretty far on that. They're off, you're not asking the like, living room, have a conversation with me about the movie I just saw. That's like not the thing you want to do. How did you like that movie, Living Room? Yeah, you, you, TV, you just watched the same movie. What do you think? So, uh, I, I think as, as long as we're in that sort of like task-oriented thing where there's a clear goal and you can define success very clearly, I, mean, I think we'll get there. Maybe uh, piggybacking on that. So, um, digital assistant smart devices require a lot of training data, right? And um, for all of you, maybe, but David, if you could start, uh, how can we strike a balance between collecting and using data for training models and, and making assistants smarter and having better conversations and being more useful while at the same time not opening up users to massive privacy invasions? Very hard. I, I will say, for, so for the Alexa Prize you don't have an answer, a direct answer. Uh, well, I'll say that, at least for the Alexa Prize, we, we had no training data to some degree, and Amazon's been very, very uh, privacy-oriented in terms of what they were willing to share at all times. Um, so we don't even, yeah, many things that we use, they go, oh, that'd be useful, we're like, no, we don't have that. But in terms of like how you might train a bot, I mean, especially it's typical for say, startups, if you want to start a company, where do you get conversational data, and that's often social media. <laughs> You just sort of look at the, the transcripts of people interacting back and forth, and that's uh, I mean, that becomes a very rich source of data. So those large social media companies that you might be able to think of are probably using their, that right now for for, tra for training these kind of general purpose chatbots. A lot of it just comes from who has the money to pay people to sit around and like interact with these things over and over and over in different situations. Yeah, Sarah or Jenny, do you have a sense? Do you have a um, sense on? Like, how can we maybe strike a balance between training these models and, and having better assistance, but not invading privacy as much? Yeah, it's a difficult challenge for sure, and uh, uh, the boundary there is very thin. And uh, one thing that you can do is anonymize the data, so try to randomize that kind of data set that you collected and uh, uh, like the people aware that you're conducting a test uh, and have uh, like training uh, also for the people to uh, to be aware about that. So this might be like the first step. The closest example I can think of is, um, you know, as we were reviewing the data for, that was um, uh, extracted from, from children's apps, I called a friend I have at PBS Kids, who is um, one of the heads of, of digital media there, and he said that they use a, you know, so it's not exactly training an algorithm, but it is getting app analytics to understand how are kids using this app? Are they, you know, where are the bugs? How can we um, make sure that it's both engaging, but kids are using it in the way that we intended. And so he said they just were, have worked on it for a while, but they've create, created like a random hashed code that, that can track that user using that specific app over time, but it doesn't link back to that child's device or any other persistent identifier. Um, and he, they said it's totally feasible, and, and his, his basic ethic was like, if we get hacked, um, and someone takes our data, we really don't want to then be PBS kids whose, whose data is then kind of, um, can be traced back to specific children. And so I, I totally agree with that ethic and then have shared that with other um, companies that I've talked to about you know, all the COPPA revisions that are going, been proposed and how do you allow data analysis for the purposes of internal operations like that without it being then shared with a third party that could potentially um, share it for other purposes. And um, hoping that the PBS Kids approach could become the norm or a gold standard of what children, child-directed um, 
apps, at least, could do, child-directed interactive media. The other problem, though, is that there's plenty of apps or, or content on YouTube or other platforms that don't consider them child-directed but are definitely used by children. And being able to, you know, um, like Europe has done, it try to define it as media that is likely to be used or accessed by children rather than it just being that ch children are your, your intended audience. And what do you think parents can do in that equation? So uh, as we wrote up the, that paper, I was like, I don't know what to tell parents to do other than to use PBS Kids Acts. So I, um, we basically put Surge's website, which is the search to, um so you can look up what apps you've used or your child has used and just see what data they collect and who they share it with. And that's kind of the, the best way to do it at this point. I've also um, told, you know, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, like the keynote speaker was saying, is that some degree of consumer pressure is needed for parents to be, once they're aware of this, be like, oh, I don't, I want to know this stuff ahead of time, before it is downloaded. I want it to be very clear on the app store or have clear um, guardrails around, um, you know, what shows up in the design for family section. And so I don't know that parents yet have the knowledge or motivation or interest in applying that consumer pressure. So I've also talked with Google Play to try to see what changes they can make in the design for family section. Yeah, it's interesting how the, the technology companies, to some extent, take on a regulatory role. Right? Like yeah, they, yeah. they have to police these apps, and um, it's really up to them how much they feel the pressure to act upon what they perceive as maybe negative press or, or negative reactions from the public. Um, Sarah, you and your collaborators are looking for really creative ways to exploit your technology. Right? Um, you said it's like a laser that um, people use in presentations. I've seen pictures of the laser, not quite, right? But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, was con I was wondering, um, how, how concerned do you think should consumers be about attacks on their smart devices, and what do you think they should do to protect themselves? So uh, regarding leg commands, uh, attack is very easy to defend. Uh, it means that you have to put your uh, smart speaker uh, not close to window, so it's very easy. Uh, but beyond that, or maybe for a more uh, easy way to attack these devices, there are many techniques that you can uh, uh, actually uh, do. And uh, the ma most easy thing that you can apply is pers uh, personalization. So. It, uh, in the settings of Alexa, but also Google Home, you can train the device uh, uh, with your voice and ability to disable some feature uh, in base on who is using the device at that moment, recognize your voice. Um, the technology, or maybe we demonstrate in the paper, that is not completely uh, successful right now in terms of uh, uh, distinguish between people. But uh, uh, I know that Alexa, for example, uh, not allow, if it doesn't recognize your voice, to purchase things. So one of the things that you can do is, uh, uh, like as you do uh, with your parenting control on Netflix, for example. So certain actions are not allowed in uh, a smart speaker and other IoT uh, if uh, the person is not verified. Another thing that Siri does, for example, is that uh, certain action, uh, critical action, are not supposed to uh, be activated just only by voice. For example, uh, if you uh, basically want to open a smart lock with Siri, it will ask you not only to like, say the command, uh, but also unlock your phone. So you have to have two devices, actually, or maybe your voice, and uh, the phone in your hand to basically recognize you. So this is a technique that is uh, very easy to do, and even if uh, it becomes uh, like uh, uh, not so usable, or maybe from the standpoint of usability, or maybe the people get stressed, oh, I have to take my phone and press a button, oh my god. <laughs> but is actually useful, or maybe there is a purpose of that. So this might be 
Yeah, I think it points also to an interesting tension between security and privacy to some extent, right? So, um, if, if you have, if you train your smart speaker, hey, this is my voice, um, versus this is my wife's voice or the children's voices, right? Then it also means the company can create individual profiles of who you are and can actually disambiguate between different users, right? Like we all probably like that Netflix has different uh, user profiles or allows you to create different user profiles. But it actually helps the company too because they can distinguish between oh how many people are actually in this household and what does every person like instead of having like a modeled uh, profile of everyone. So yeah, this is actually uh, the correlated problem to that. And uh, as we discussed him before, if we are not uh, like aware about rules on how these companies use this data and to do what. Uh, we cannot, or maybe we don't know. So, uh, as uh, uh, I always mentioned in uh, during the discussion, uh, some external entities, I think it has to enforce that kind of, of rules about how to use these data and uh, not let the company uh, just uh, rule, uh, rule by themselves. So, this uh, definitely can might be uh, the solution of that. So are two problem correlated. But if you can provide the voice uh, as you, it's important to understand how the company used that data. Great. I think that's a great point to open it up for, for questions from the audience. I think we have one over there. Hey. Um, I think that there's a great sense of powerlessness out there um, and in here. And I think that it, there's this feeling that the technology world is sort of a wild west. And it would be useful to have a, a historical analogy that we might be able to draw upon. Um, so I think the, the creation of medicines and foods, for that matter, um, was a wild west at one point. And in 1906, the Food and Drug Administration was created. Um, and it's obviously evolved a lot over the years. But it <clears throat> imposed a large number of fairly stringent constraints um, on a previously unregulated or weakly regulated environment. And so one question for the panelists is, is that a useful analogy for the control um, and product safety for the digital applications? And what should it be doing? I think that's a good analogy, and I think it's, uh, I like it better than, than you know, likening technology to tobacco or another addictive stuff, substance. I think it, it makes more sense that it should be um, kind of controlled and regulated in a way that's best for the person who's using it or eating it or um, consuming it. The, uh, a consumer-oriented uh, protection uh, uh, approach. But I, there, so there used to be the Office of Internet something that was that went away. Do you know what I'm talking about? That was part of the federal government. I think it went away in the Clinton or Bush era. Um, and so I've heard conversations within um, privacy conferences about people bringing that back um, to be kind of akin to the Information Commissioner's Office of the UK. So I've, I've heard that um, some rumblings about that, but I don't know if it would be part of a, like a larger uh, privacy legislation. Yeah. Um... Maybe also to direct to the question. I, th I think the safety framing is definitely an interesting one um, because we are realizing that there are real risks to the technologies that um, can cause privacy harms, um, but also all kinds of other harms. So I think that's that's an interesting framing. I think a different framing that's also been is being discussed is uh, well, should companies have fiduciary um, responsibility for the data of their users and and actually. Um, be required to use the data in ways that are beneficial to the users and not just to themselves. So I think that's another potential frame of thinking about that. Um, I think what we definitely need to get away from is like, as, as long as I have consent, everything goes, which is our current legal framework, which is kind of the Wild West, right? So the, the Federal Trade Commission, who is kind of the consumer protection agency in this regard, is bound by the FTC Act, which says, uh, they are. They can investigate uh, deceptive and unfair trade practices. So as long as the practices are sufficiently transparent uh, and you're not absolutely coerced into something, then 
um, it is likely not violating um, or, or allowing the FTC to really step in. And that's something that the FTC has been struggling with as well. And they've been kind of bending the rules, uh, well, not bending the rules. They're, they're kind of ex interpreting what that actually means in the digital privacy sector in ways that um, are getting creative and are going beyond just saying because it's in the terms of service, it's, um, it's a fair disclosure. Right? So I think this is really a difficult, uh, like we need strong enforcement probably in this country to, to really see effective uh, consumer protections there. And I think everyone's kind of looking towards Europe where um, we, we definitely see that the general data protection regulation has had a large impact on how companies around the world are approaching privacy. And the reason for that is that the general data protection regulation says, well, uh, you can find, be fined up to 4% of your global turnover um, if you violate the GDPR. Right? So it's a really big stick that uh, got everyone to pay attention and actually devote funds in companies to be GDPR compliant. Um, the University of Michigan ran a large GDPR compliance effort to make sure that the university complies. Right? This is a US university in the United States uh, that's trying to, to um, adhere to that. So, so I agree, right? There's lots of helplessness, and but uh, the the big way to make a difference is to really um, have stronger oversight for for um, companies and also put limitations on what can be done with data. I think. Okay, sorry. Next question. Hi. Thank you all so much for um, joining us today. I was wondering. Um, and thinking about voice assistants and children specifically, admittedly, voice assistants have considerable privacy concerns, especially for folks who don't look into it, don't know how to access them, as we previously noted. But they admittedly have many great tools that can serve educational and skill behavioral um, purposes, right? So do you perceive a need for recommendations for parents similar to um, Jenny's based on screen time and children um, that are more widely uh, received um, in the context of voice assistance and children? Yes, thank you. <coughs> um, so the, um, in terms of there being uh, official you know, policy recommendations like something from the American Academy of Pediatrics is, um, is uh, there needs to be more research first to determine the, um, to really drive recommendations because right now it's, it's mostly based on kind of common sense and, um, and specifically Common Sense Media, the organization that puts out a lot of guidance for, for parents, um, that some of it, is, a lot of it is evidence-based, some of it when we don't have evidence yet, it's very uh, balanced and it, um, has a very pragmatic approach. Um, I think that um, I get interviewed quite a bit about, you know, what's the difference between listening to a podcast and listening to, you know, having background TV on. And so I do like the fact that a, a speaker can provide a shared digital environment for the family to listen to something together and it can generate conversation and it's much harder to share media use around a small screen than in a um, than listening to the sounds together, um, but again, it's about minimizing the amount of data that needs to be collected to make that work effectively for the family, um, and also um, kind of you know a lot of people have been worried that smart speakers then kind of supplant the role of the parent in answering homework questions or being um, you know a conversational partner, and I think that. There's, uh, I think kids know the limits of what Alexa or other smart speakers can do, and they find it hilarious that they can confuse her and that they can, like, you know, gross her out and things like that. But I think, um, you know, I'm more, uh, uh, it, you know, as as was discussed today, is that right now the limits are, you know, these smart speakers can answer a lot of fact-based questions, and so I just don't want kids thinking. That that's all the knowledge is that that's out there is just fact-based pieces of information that can be computed really easily. Is that there's a lot of other information that they get from parents that's much more contextualized into their meaning systems of their family. When you tell stories about your childhood or or your fam the rest of your family members, there's a lot more meaning making as part of that than there is. Again, all of this I'm doing this based on child development theory. I'm not doing this based on any evidence. So. That's really what we need first. 
David, what would it take for a smart speaker to interact with a child age appropriately? Right? Like, how would you make that happen? Like, in your figure, like the last one was like, how do we how do we communicate? I mean, we have no information about the who we're speaking with, but I will say that some of the participants or conversants are far more interested in Minecraft than I would expect your average adult to be. Uh, I think in some sense that with respect to the knowledge, like making sure that you're actually discussing age-appropriate ways or generalizing the concept because of, you know, child's concept of certain things, you can talk about it with them, but they don't really understand the sort of the breadth or the depth of it if you want to talk to a child about depth. Maybe that's not even an appropriate thing for your smart speaker to be chatting about your child with, but it is something people do ask. <laughs> okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so, um, I really like the medical analog, um, and from that, the FDA. Um, and Sarah, I know you've done some work in, in medical and IoT, um, but knowing the FDA and knowing that the medical field has kind of like a, a pre-market uh, pre uh, approval process, which is pretty restrictive, um, and they're also kind of underfunded and under-resourced, uh, that sort of model I don't think fits even quite, uh, quite correctly to consumer uh, technology for privacy and security. So, uh, recalls also are kind of hard to do if you lost data to the world, uh, as an impossible. Um, but I was just curious your thoughts on what, what kind of regulatory model might actually work? All of you, by the way, not just Sarah. This is a very hard question, just because, oh, maybe I uh, definitely um, agree with uh, uh, the fact that as uh, uh, in the medical product uh, uh, evolution, we just uh, uh, enforce policy so we don't uh, enter to the market if you don't have this certification. This has some pro and uh, something against it. Oh, my sorry. <laughs> So uh, we have a long time to enter into the market. That uh, is uh, going against uh, what uh, the company wants so to, to enter in, in, the, in the market as soon as possible. So uh, I agree that is not, uh, or maybe it's full of defects and have uh, some sort of uh, uh, like a restriction. Uh, that we might not have uh, in an IoT uh, environment, but definitely is a like a is a start step on that. The thing is, the more the technology advances, so we need to have this regulatory in the loop because if not, we lost. So we have uh, uh, we lost the development on that. So uh, as uh, uh, we saw in the panel before, like the law is behind. Uh, what is the evolution of these devices. So it's not completely wrong to take an example as what the FDA does, but it, is, it needs to be different. So we can take some rule of them and also, uh, like, for example, I'm talking about, uh, like, from the perspective of a computer science engineer, um, we have a restricted policy, for example, when we build cars or when we build something like uh, um, uh, basically uh, aircraft. So we have rules to uh, like build code that is robust to something, uh, or maybe to uh, attacks or even like resilient to every kind of vulnerability that you can have. IoT doesn't follow any rules right now. So everything can put and use data, or maybe this is connected also to uh, the way to the, uh, they collect the data. So uh, I think we have uh, for sure like to open a, a dialogue with all these uh, actors and also regulatory part. So I understand that it's not completely successful, but they are making it. <laughs> I mean, the, the two years ago, they start uh, to acknowledge that the heart is uh, physical vulnerabilities. They were not aware of that, and they 
it takes a long process to get them like the documentation, understand what kind of like primary rules they have to agree. So we need or maybe I think it's necessary to pass in the same process here. So um, one regulatory approach that, that I particularly like in this regard um, is what we see in Europe. So the, the GDPR requires companies to conduct so-called data protection impact assessments, more widely they're more widely known as privacy impact assessments. So if you're building a new product or service or tool that um, uses personally identifiable data, you need to um, assess the, the privacy impacts that will have for different, different groups and individuals and users. And then um, that's something that's also being discussed in current uh, proposals for federal privacy legislation in the US. But an important piece in the European legislation is that it, the GDPR also requires privacy by design and privacy by default which means if you identify risks, then you need to mitigate them in how you build the technology, and the privacy protective way needs to be the default option. Right? So um, if you want to collect more data than is absolutely necessary, you can do that, but it can't be the default. And, and I think kind of limiting what technologies can do in that way um, doesn't mean you're necessarily limiting the functionality. Right? Like uh, someone else mentioned today this uh, tension between privacy and innovation, but I think what it, and I, I don't think that exists, what, what it just means is that if you want to do more with the data, or if you want to collect more data, or want to do more with the data you have already, you need to have an honest conversation with your user about this, and need to communicate to them how you're planning on using the data, and get their consent for that particular use. And I think that's, that's a good model, but there are also problems with that. I just have a quick question to follow up with that. So how common is venture capitalist funding in Europe in terms of getting things to scale really quickly before you, and debugging later? And with all of this pre-preparation that needs to happen to be GDPR, GDPR compliant, how, you know, has that, um, you know, affected trying to get large new innovations out to market really quickly? Caveat, I'm not a market economist. <laughs> um, I, I think we have uh, there, there are venture capitalists in, in Europe as well, but you, you know the regulatory framework requires you to take safety measures, and you have to take those the same way you have to do that in other industries as well. And I think that's probably a good approach when we're talking about information technology, because it's not just all fun and games. All right, uh, that's probably the bombshell to end this panel with. <laughs> <laughs>